Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Dubious Knowledge. Your Galarian lore show. I don't know what I said there. I meant to say lore show, but it came out lore sure. <laughs> I'm Jason. How are you guys tonight? <laughs> With me tonight, I have the lovely Corey. How are you? Hello. Doing well. How are you, Jason? I'm doing well. And I have the handsome Mike. How are you? I'm great, Jason. You went really Midwestern there. That's I, that's what I took that as. You know, lure show. Like that's what I thought you were slipping into Minnesota. I don't know. I, I've been watching a lot of Warrior. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just like speaking Cantonese, like subconsciously. By the way, just want to say thank you for that. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. Thank you for that gift. So. Yeah, tonight we are talking about Saren Ray. This one's been, uh, it's been coming. We've been trying to get this one on on recording for a while. With the release of Rage of Elements, we wanted to focus on one of the deities that had one of the elements in their domains. And Saren Ray was up for grabs, as was Rovagug who has air and earth. Asmodeus was also potential because Asmodeus has fire. Gazra was a potential because of air and water. But we ended up doing Saren Ray. And Saren Ray is awesome. I, I've always enjoyed Saren Ray. I, th I think Saren Ray has mm -hmm. been... As a matter of fact, I think Saren Ray was the very first cleric that I've built in Pathfinder 1st Edition was a cleric of Saren Ray. So, have, you, have any either of you ever played a uh, Serenite? I have never played a Serenite, but one of my most memorable moments in Pathfinder involved two Serenites. Um, I had my very second Pathfinder campaign was running Curse of the Crimson Throne for a group of friends and one of my friends chose to be a cleric of Saren Ray. another friend I challenged to play a paladin because he typically played chaotic evil characters and I wanted to put him outside his comfort zone and he chose to also be a paladin of Saren Ray. and then when he had to, er over the course of the campaign, they founded an orphanage together as the Saren Bros. And when the Paladin player had to regrettably leave the campaign because he was moving, he took me aside and asked if he could do a heel turn. And went anti-Paladin of Rovagug. <laughs> because he had seen too much suffering uh, inflicted on others in the city of Corvosa, and nobody ever changing their ways and set fire to the orphanage killed a bunch of kids and left the party just real, real Anakin Skywalker which that, was a... that moment has now been made canon in one of my other games with a friend of ours, Cody, playing the lone survivor from that orphanage. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I also had a paladin of Saren Ray when I GM'd Curse of the Crimson Throne. A good buddy of mine, Bill, played a paladin of Saren Ray. That was a... That was a good time. That seems to be a good AP to have a paladin in, though, right? Oh, it's a very good AP to have yeah. a paladin in. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, Jason, I have to say yes to playing a character who worships Saren Ray or, like, venerates Saren Ray because I'm in your Quest for the Frozen Flame game. So yeah. both of my characters that I've had in that game tip technically were Serenites. True. That's absolutely even though, true. Even though Seven just showed up, like... What two days late? Two days later? Two days after? Right. So. 
Yeah, Obviously. yeah. And we'll we'll get into that. We'll get into that a little bit in spoiler corner. Well, not really spoiler corner. It's not super it's not a big spoiler, but just where Serenray's worshipped and some of the names she goes by in the different regions. Um because in the uh, realm of the Mammoth Lord, she's not really known as Saren, right? She has a different name up there, so um, which makes sense to the lore, her lore up there. So, but yeah, before we get into it, Saren, the real, the real quick basics. Who wants to run us through that? Yeah, yeah. Usually my job, so I'll go for it. Saren Ray, also known as the Dawn Flower, the Healing Flame, the Everlight, the Cleansing Light, Sister Cinder, Grandmother Grace, and the Healing Flame. For fans of Critical Role, one of those might sound very familiar. As before they moved over to D&D 5e, uh, Critical Role was a Pathfinder campaign, and Pike Trickfoot was a cleric of Saren Ray, not a cleric of the Everlight which I don't know how Mercer gets away with using that, but... <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> this is power. Serenre is a goddess who teaches temperance and patience in all things. Compassion and peace are her greatest virtues, and if enemies of the faith can be redeemed, they should be. Her edicts are destroy the spawn of Rovagug. That is number one priority. Protect your allies, provide aid to the sick and wounded, and seek and allow redemption. Anathema to her are creating undead, lying, denying a repentant creature an opportunity for redemption, and failing to strike down evil when it is not repentant. Areas of concern are sun, redemption, honesty, and healing. She is currently for another, what, three months, a neutral good deity. In 1e, she had allowed lawful good, neutral good, chaotic good, and true neutral clerics. And in 2e, she just allows good. Period. Lawful, neutral, chaotic, whatever flavor. If you're good, you can worship her and get clerical or champion powers. If you are neutral, you are out of luck. You can still worship her, she just doesn't give you any goodies. First edition domains, fire, glory, good, healing, and sun, with subdomains of Agathian, day, heroism, light, redemption, restoration, resurrection, and revelation. Uh, second edition, she still has fire, still has healing, still has sun. She has added truth. And alternate domains are repos. Uh, favored weapon is the scimitar. Favored animal is the dove. Favored colors are blue, white, and gold. Worshippers tend to be healers, farmers, and redeemed evildoers. Holy symbol is an angelic onk in the shape of her body with her arms spread and wings raised high. And then her realm is the Everlight Nirvana. Which is weird because it's also one of her nicknames, but whatever. Everlight is on the sea far side of the seas of No Shadow, which is a crystal clear body of water that is constantly illuminated by the light of Everlight. Awesome. Yeah, it's Sharon Ray is awesome. <laughs> You're gonna hear hear me say that a lot during this episode. So one of the things I uh, immediately that jumps out why I think she's so awesome is because of her backstory, how she became a deity. It is one of the coolest and most metal backstories that uh, you can get because she started off as just an angel. She was just just an angel. Run of the mill angel and then an imperial lord. But Yep. Yeah, she just she was just 
a run of the mill and I just hit my microphone. Sorry about that. Um, just a run of the mill angel. I mean, she was very kind, very loving. And she, her job was to just guide the energy from the sun to where it needed to go. And then along the way, battle evil where, where it was. But then one day, some big old huggable friend by the name of Rovagug decided to show up. Rovagug, as we all know, wanted to destroy Galarian and all of Galarian's sister planets, plunging them into eternal darkness. Well, Saren Ray nom, didn't want nom. To Yeah, Saren Ray didn't want to have that. You know, the 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 angel who is supposed to guide the energy of and the light of the sun to these planets did not want these planets to go into eternal darkness, as you can well imagine. Well, she was one of the very first to go ahead and make a stand against Rovagug. And along the way, ended up sacrificing herself for the good of all and in order to inspire the rest of like the angelic hosts and it's at that point that for some how in some way she was made and ascended into godhood anything else I need to add well I, I do want to say that there are like in most religions, conflicting views on the nature of Saren Ray's ascension. Because, well, that is one myth of how she became a goddess. There's also the, the myth that is written in the Windsong Testaments, which very much states that Saren Ray was one of the first eight deities to be created after Phrasma created this universe. She was right there alongside Desna as Desna created the first stars and she fell in love with the beauty of the stars and breathed, breathed life into some of them to create the first suns. And that's... That's the other version of Serenary's creation myth. So... You have two conflicting ones. Pick and choose which one you want to worship. <laughs> I was so excited for about three seconds. As soon as you... Jason, as soon as you were like, does anybody have anything else? I was like, I'm going to hit him with that other creation myth. And then Corey came in and <laughs> just... I, I should have just been like, go ahead, Corey, just say it. Go ahead, talk about it. Because I, as soon as I, 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 I was like, oh, the Wind Song Testaments. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Corey <laughs> loves that book. I should have known. And I was just like, I'm just going to sit here and be color commentary. I'm going to let you two, you two guys just be the, you know, you two. Every, I'm just, I just want to talk about the Living Sword. Okay. Just let me know when I can talk about the Living Sword. <laughs> <laughs> also, I just want to say, she is a, her pantheon is the cosmic caravan one with of. one of yes true one of her pantheons but it's only isn't it only three isn't it only three thank you Pete. uh technically isn't... four but one of them is a spoiler so it's moved to the spoiler corner okay uh, we'll talk about that in spoiler corner but speaking of pantheons yes the cosmic caravan the cosmic caravan is a collection of well, astronomers will tell you it's the constellations of Galarian. It's Galarian's version of the Zodiac. But also, worshippers worship gods related to the stars as the Cosmic Caravan Pantheon. And that includes Saren Ray, because the sun is a star. Also includes Desna, Ashava, the Black Butterfly... Pelura, the the god of old Sarkoris, uh, the elven god Ketaphis, 
and the outer god Yug Yog Sothoth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful addition to the uh, pantheon there. Apparently, the pantheon used to include Grotus. They kicked him out of that one. Well, he is crazy. He's a little <laughs> wild, right? Like, he's that guy that shows up to the party and you're like, how are you already drunk on tequila? <laughs> and Sukio, mm -hmm. in, certain, in certain regions, right? Only in certain regions is Sukio also, con is also part of the Cosmic Caravan? Yeah, he replaced Rodus. Yeah. In the regions where people know about him anyway. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, Cosmic Caravans were, was really cool because that one was, um, that one was, in, was it invented or it was brought up f during Abomination Vaults, like in the player's guide, right? Or was it brought up I before that? I, let me look. I mean, I know it's existed before then. Okay. I want to say it first got mentioned in one E. Okay. Uh, yeah. It was mentioned as far back as Pathfinder issue 14. Oh, very cool. Children of the Void. Second Darkness, book two? Two. Yes. Very, very <laughs> cool. Nice. That's awesome. And uh, the, the other pantheons that she's part of that we can talk about before Spoiler Corner are the Path of the Heavens, which are deities that help travelers and voyagers find their way. The progress of the sun helps people know what direction is what. So Serenray is important. Sukio, the moon, and Desna, the stars. Nocticula is the final member of the Pantheon for her part in using the cover of darkness to shelter travelers and outcasts. So it's kind of like um the like sailors that use that use the stars to to kind of find their way. That's very cool. I like that. And then there's my favorite of the de the uh Serenite uh pantheons and that is the prismatic ray which is just gals being pals. Wow. <laughs> Uh, it is the prismatic ray consists of just Saren Ray, Shaylin, and Desna, and it's just it's just their poly triad who grants worshippers special powers. Yep, beautiful and wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's not a whole pals. lot of lore behind it, because um, it was what just. Just in a it, it was a blog, blog post, post on how to create a pantheon. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, hey, if you wanted to create a pantheon, here you go. And now it's canon. Well, I mean, it was canon when Gods and Magic came out. Because yeah. that's when they included the the wonderful artwork of... What is it? It's Shaylin playing music. Well, Saren Ray braids Desna's hair, I think. Page six of the Gods yep. and Magic. Ah, no, it's Shaylin braiding Desna's hair while Saren Ray just basks under a tree. Saren Ray's just being like, <laughs> like Vegeta, just kind of leaning against a tree. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, thank you, Quandry, for that suggestion about including the pantheons and. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do that and remember to do that from here on out. So thank you for that. But yeah. <clears throat> Beyond that, she is depicted mostly as a woman who has bronze skin. Hair is flames. In some cases, it's super long we're talking like rapunzel long where it's like dozens and dozens of yards long in other cases it's just down to her mid back or shorter she can she has a sim often has a scimitar in one hand and a moat of light in the other and yeah it's that's that's pretty typical 
of mm-hmm. most most Saren Ray's aspects. Yeah. And like like we said before, uh, she's also big on the redemption arc. She is probably the most merciful of the gods that allow paladins. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that is best illustrated by another little piece of her lore in that uh, she is she is the primary deity of the Kelish Empire in Kadira and east of Kadira and the Kelish Empire has been at war or had been at war with Taldor for 500 years yeah and at at one point, uh, Grand Prince Stavian the First banned the worship of Saren Ray in Taldor because of her her involvement with the Kelish Empire, and very specifically with the Cult of the Dawnflower, which is the less merciful branch of Serenite worship, where they offer you mercy one time, and if you don't take them up on that mercy, then no sec- or no third chances, you're done. But because of the Cult of the Dawnflower and her widespread worship in hate- their hated enemies' land, Taldor banned the worship of Serenray, uh, persecuted and killed the priests of Serenray that were in the country, burned down the temples, just effectively wiped them out of the country. A few years ago, in canonical timeline, worship of Saren Ray was legalized again in Taldor. Mm-hmm. But even while it was illegal, there was underground worship, as tends to happen when people are mm-hmm. persecuted for their beliefs. Underground worship included things like handing out sunflowers to people to show that you were of the faith and things like that recently they unbanned the religion again and as a show of good faith they gave the church their plot of land back in Opara the capital Mm -hmm. city of Taldor and over the next couple of years devoted Serenites reclaimed sacred sites all over Taldor and also started bringing relics to Opara to rebuild the cathedral there. And what they did is they built the, uh, the House of Dawn's Redemption. And unlike most Serenite, Serenite, uh, temples, the House of Dawn's Redemption has a singular focus in just being devoted to the healing and redemptive arts. They're not so focused on the destruction of evil as most Serenite churches are. They just care about the redemption of evil and forgiveness and healing powers of the sun. And it's a way for the Serenite church in Taldor to say, hey, what you did to us was shitty. But we're going to turn the other cheek and we're going to be the bigger person and we're going to offer you forgiveness without even saying that we're we're directly offering you forgiveness by making our church here just about forgiveness. And unlike, unlike the traditional depiction of Saren Ray that Jason just described, where she's ready for battle with a scimitar in one hand and a ball of fire in the other... The the Saren Ray at the House of Dawn's Redemption has her arms outspread with light in each hand instead of a scimitar in one. Yeah, that's that reminds me too of the the depiction of Saren Ray in some parts of the Mwangi where she goes by the name Grand- Grandmother Grace. 
where Saren Ray is depicted as an old woman. And again, in it's because the in that partic- those particular areas where Saren Ray is worshipped as Grandmother Grace, they focus on the healing and the redemptive aspects of the religion more so than the destruction of evil part of it. So it it, it it's fascinating just how how what a great job that they did with Saren Ray and how these different aspects can have these cultural ties and cultural influences. And I want to bring that up again because I'll let Mike speak to it because I kind of hinted at it earlier where up in the realm of the Mammoth Lords, she's not really known as Saren Ray. I mean, she's if you mention Saren Ray, people will know who you're talking about. But up there, she's known as Sister Cinder. Because as well as you can imagine, up in the realm of the Mammoth Lords, it's fucking cold. <laughs> so there, fire is life, quite literally. And so the focus is more on fire and 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 less on the on the redemption and the war and more on the fire because that's what you need to survive. And I don't know if you want to if there's anything else you need you want to add to that Mike. I uh, I mean, yeah, I have a f- I don't want to spoil so much of it, you know what I mean? Cuz like most well, we of it we can like, save it for later. Yeah, we can save that for later, but yeah, th- so spoiler I mean, corner. Yeah, it is very it is very cool with Paizo having the 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 wherewithal to realize like they're not going to call her Saren Ray in the north with the Mammoth Lords. They're going to call her something different and same in the Wangi where they will they'll just adapt her to their aesthetics. I do want to say because I had to say this, uh Paizo is really good at making really great names. The House of the Redemptive like that is the greatest that's one of the greatest names ever. Like I kind of want to make that another like i want to steal that and put that in our quest for the frozen flame game like that would be (laughs) the new house in the broken tusks i kind of want to do that yeah that that whole story Corey, is really awesome and it's fascinating Mm -hmm. what it really reminds me a lot of is and and i'm gonna i'm gonna continue bringing this up because we have new new listeners coming in every single time but one of my one of my undergrad degrees was on history and the focus on the Crusades, and so what this really reminds me of is Jerusalem and the Holy Lands in the Crusades, where you have the you have the the Christians and you have the Muslims who are who are warring for Jerusalem, and you know where they would whoever was in charge would raise the temple and build their temple. And then, you know, of course, you know, decades later, the other the other faction would come in and raise that temple and build their temple. And it's just this back and forth and back and forth. And of course, the people of Jerusalem that were there, you know, they would worship whoever they were worshiping if, and it would go underground if it wasn't in power. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and if it was, the other faction would go in underground. And so it it, it really brings that crusader type flair and I like how these little points in history have have influenced and you can at least for me I can pull though at those threads because I've studied it and um and seeing how okay fine we're at peace you can have the land back now and of course we're gonna subtly backhand you in the face by, okay, we're going to forgive you without actually saying we're going to forgive you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, what is the... the I, I'm just assuming this here, but the 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 statue of Saren Ray with the two hands of flames, that's basically the, the healing arts, correct? Like the healing and the mm-hmm. redemption as opposed to the, the, the sword. Okay. Yeah. Like I'm sitting yeah, here thinking, and, like, and, like it's not flame; it's just balls of light in this statue. Like it's, it's very much the the most non-violent art of Saren Ray that I've ever seen. 
other than the lounging by a tree with her girlfriends. Okay, that helps me. That, that you saying light, like I, uh, I posted it in our chat, Mike. Yeah. Oh, I should look at that, huh? That's very. <laughs> that's very cool. That's very very cool. Oh, that and is cool. Th- what I want to bring up too is if we're talking about big centers of worship and temples is. We don't have Heath with us today. Um, Unfortunately, Mr. Parker came down with an illness, lost his voice, and has um, had to go see the doctor because his throat is absolutely destroying him right now. But I was able to um, do some do some work and pull up some do my own research, if you will, on Saren Ray and Starfinder, and. Holy moly! It the the lore there is phenomenal, and I'm I'm gonna go ahead and do this do this the super quick version of the backstory. So Saren Ray again, she is who she is. You no, know, the same goddess, the same this you know fire and the sun and everything. Like she she is basically the Saren Ray from Galarian. It's just that it's less Galarian centric and. She is bringing the light and energy of the sun to all the planets in the packed worlds. Now, real quick, about a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago, this is in packed worlds time. There was a group of priests and scientists that were stationed to study the sun and the connection that the sun has to the dawn, the dawn flower. And what they found was this, this, like, basically blew their mind. They found these structures within the star's plasma that were tethered to one another. But for some reason, these structures were completely protected and unharmed by that the star's plasma. And, the, like, this the basically sea of flames. And... What happened was there was one Serenite in particular who was ba- was running an orphanage uh, in Castrovel. Her name was Imril Novahart. And she, this, she was a devout Serenite. And when she found out about this, she, she basically had a vision of seeing herself walking through the streets of these bubble cities that are that were on these structures that were inside the the plasma of the sun and she knew at that point that it, that was Saren Ray calling to her so she traveled to the station spoke to the priest there and convinced a few that were operating that station that, hey, you know, this is actually my deity's will. This is Serenary's will. Will you travel with me to this structure? So she convinced them, and a small group of them went, got into a starship, and went to the structure, which is the Burning Archipelago, and plotted a course to the largest of these bubble cities, and um, tried to basically protect the starship as best they could. Unfortunately, the technology wasn't quite there yet, and the heat and the gravity completely crushed the vessel. And after a few moments, what seemed like these people were going to basically die a really painful death being crushed by the extreme gravity of the sun and the plasma and the heat what happened was this tunnel opened up and allowed them to pass safely into the bubble city and the crew basically discovered this mega structure that became known as the radiant citadel and that became and has since become the epicenter 
of all Saren Ray worship in the Pact Worlds. And the Radiant Citadel is this... If you can find art for the Radiant Citadel in the Pact Worlds, it is just jaw-dropping. It, I shared some art in our channel, our Dubious Knowledge channel. It is absolutely incredible. So that's just a little bit of uh, Saren Ray lore that I wanted to share with you all if you hadn't heard that story before. Yeah, and by the way, Nova Heart became the Grand Cleric of Saren Ray, and she still is to this day in the Pact Worlds. I think we should also mention that the iconic cleric for Pathfinder is a cleric of Saren Ray as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Kyra. Good point. Kyra, yep. Very good point. Yeah. Uh, always has been. And Saren Ray was... Saren Ray was the fifth god to get a write-up in the Pathfinder books. Because... No. No, it would have been seventh. Seventh god. Because she got written up in the second book of uh, Legacy of Fire. Okay. That would make sense, yeah. Which we should, we should mention, too, now that we're bringing up Kyra, that the church is very supportive of marriage between anyone. Mm -hmm. And... There is no stigma at all attached to the uh, marriage between any genders, nor is there any stigma attached to divorce. And as a matter of fact, the church will delight in the second or the third or the fourth marriage just as much as the first, as just, just so long as the person is truly and um, honestly in love with one another. So, yeah, we do want to call that out because we have had some sticklers uh, about that in previous deities. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. And and if you if they can, they they prefer to have the marriage outside during daylight hours because this is a big cause for celebration. And as the deity of the sun, and you can well imagine why they would want to have it during outside during the daylight hours where they can sing and dance and just have a great time. And, uh, you know, we noted that Saren Ray is an Apollya triad of her own. The iconic cleric is also married to the iconic rogue. Uh, they tied the knot early in the second edition of the game, so congratulations to both of them, Mauriciel and Kyra. May you have happy, happy years of adventuring together. Absolutely. So what you're telling me is, in that party, the rogue's gonna get priority healing? Because that's what it sounds like to <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Uh, probably. I I remember, like, I, I am a very... I am an old head Galarian fan. Been a fan since the very beginning. And I've been on the Paizo message boards for well over a decade now. And... James Jacobs used to have an AMA thread on the Paizo boards where you could ask him anything and he would answer. He had to shut it down because too many people were using the things he said in that thread as... Gospel truth? Argument winners. Mm-hmm. But way back when, people also made alias accounts for the various Iconics. And the Iconics would also get AMA threads created on the Paizo message boards where you could ask the Iconics anything. And most of these were aliases of other Paizo po posters. So, not really anything you could take as canon truth except for Mauriciel. 
the Mauricio that, thread was... Was that JJ? Was that that JJ? was James Jacobs' alias, was Mauricio <laughs> the Rogue. Uh, there were a couple other Paizo staffers that aliased as iconics. Uh, Sarah Marie was Freya the Witch. Uh, Crystal Frazier was Imrika the Inquisitor. Was so, Bowman Harsk? Bowman was not Harsk. Oh, I don't know. really? I, w- I would have guessed that Bowman was Harsk. Uh, I-, I don't know if Harsk had one. I remember Lem had one, and Lem was just a random poster. But James Jacobs was Mauricio, so you could you could kind of take the answers as canon. <laughs> and one of the longest running jokes in that thread was about how Mary was crushing on Kyra, <laughs> and. Then the comics started coming out, and the two reciprocated their love. And I'm like, James Jacobs, you madman. <laughs> I al- adore you for this. Absolutely. And, uh... Yeah, so that was, uh... That was how the, the bisexuality of the canon rogue... And the lesbian identity of the canon cleric got revealed was through the uh, the Ask Mauricio Anything thread. That's absolutely beautiful. So I wanted to you you brought you had brought up earlier about handing out sunflowers. Um, I wanted to bring up real quick too that sunflowers, as you can imagine because, uh, Corey, you brought it up. They're, they, they are kind of a symbol of the faith, so you will find them quite often planted around the d- different temples and sanctuaries to the point where in poorer communities, uh, sunflower seeds are handed out to the needy as a source of sustenance, were and where they could also be dried and ground into paste, into flour, and made into bread known as dawn flour bread. So a sunflower seed bread. And that's handed out to those who are in need and need some food and some nutrition. I now so, want to play a cleric. What's that? I now want to play a cleric of Saren Ray that what they do is they just chew sunflower seeds <laughs> and that's their that's like how they heal you that's how that's what i want to do just flavor dude, everything through the here, sunflower seeds dude here it is a leshy cleric mm-hmm. of saren ray mm-hmm. a sunflower leshy exactly of saren ray i love it that's <laughs> would a sunflower leshy chewing sunflower seeds be like chewing your fingernails hey we don't kink shame here <laughs> we don't kink shame in this house. But no, like the fruit leshy can like hand out fruit that deals like what heals like one d four, one d six, and then you could just you could just like talk to your GM and have them say, "I want to be a sunflower leshy, where my fruit is sunflower seeds, and here I'm going to hand you sunflower seeds, and that's just going to be the equivalent of the one d." 1d6 here, healing that you get. Here, here. this one's barbecue, and this one's uh, honey mustard, and this one's pickle. <laughs> Just every one you pull out is a different flavor. Love it. <laughs> that character went from being a big a big orc to a leshy in like three seconds. <laughs> there Love it is. Pathfinder. There it is. Speaking of symbols of the church, the holy text of Saren Ray Yes. Is the birth of light and truth. And it starts with the origin story and then it goes into more dogmatic. Here is how the church practices yada yada yada. But it is customary for every copy of the birth of the light and truth to have several blank pages at the end. For the owner of that book to 
chronicle their own story about how they help to redeem others and bring light into the world which I think is a fun thing to do that is really cool I like that it sort of sort of builds off of what a less extreme version of what Caden Kalian's thing is where it's just like one phrase on a plaque where this is like here is the holy text and here's a couple pages where you can chronicle your part, your contribution. I mean, sorry, Jason. By no. comparison, it's a pretty low-key holy text. It's not a, a skull that talks to everybody or <laughs> bits of your own flesh. Like, that's really giving yourself to the holy book right there when it's the strips of your own <laughs> flesh that you write on uh, that some of the other uh, deities we've, we've spoken about. Right. But yeah, I, 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 when I read that, I loved it. Like I love that. I do want to. I do want to mention that in the Pact Worlds, there are basically three, three sources of holy text. Really, really, just one. It's still the birth of light and truth. However, um, they've gone so far as to take it and basically modernize it modernize that text into a collection of poems and and songs which has been since become known as essences of Saren Ray. Hmm. So these are like I said they they basically encapsulate and really distill the the main the main points and topics of the birth of light and truth into into these smaller bite-sized bits. So so that's two. And then on top of that, inside of the Radiant Citadel, there is a giant supercomputer that is also an AI, an artificial intelligence by the name of Prism the primary repository intelligent silicon mainframe. Prism is a two-story tall supercomputer built from crystalline microprocessors encased in glass, which stands at the center of an area of the Radiant Citadel called the Refractory. It is illuminated by the sun from below using mirrors that channel and reflect the light into a rainbow of colors that dance throughout the high ceiling chamber. Now, the purpose of PRISM is to collect, edit, and broadcast historical lessons, philosophical discussions, scientific discoveries, and well-researched journalism articles created by followers of the faith. The probably the most important and the most popular one being uh, Sister Nova Hearts, or now Grand Cleric Nova Hearts, uh, famous speech when she first reached the Radiant Citadel for the very first time, which is called the Speech Under the Prominence. So, I do want to point that out. So, little, yeah, little Prism, that... Prism is kind of a big hub and repository for everything Serenite. I was going to say a little known fact here. The very beginning of the speech that she made was, does anyone have any aloe? And then continuing <laughs> on. What SPF should I have? <clears throat> oh, yes. It should be the answer. <laughs> yes. As someone who burns by looking at the sun. Yes. SPF is your friend. So, yeah. Uh, but so what else? What else we got? Let's see. Uh, we do have a couple of holidays and a couple of aphorisms. Okay, bef- before we get into that, let me real quick go over a couple of other places of worship in the Pact Worlds, and then we can get to th- we can get to that real quick. So, like I mentioned, in the Starfinder setting in the Pact Worlds, the Radiant Citadel is obviously the big one, the epicenter for all things Saren Ray. Prior to that, uh, before that was found, the big epicenter was the Holy Angel Flame 
which is located in Congregation on Absalom Station. This is, as you can imagine, just was a big holographic church, or big church that featured a large holographic image of the Dawnflower in all her splendor near the ceiling to watch over all of her worshipers. Beyond that, you have a few more places of prominence. There is... There's the high peaks of the Sun Teeth on Versys Fulbright. That's a place where the sun never stops shining. And up there is a monastery known as the Basking Monastery. And it's not a... It's not much to it at all. It's basically just several stone slabs that have been engraved with the holy symbol of Sarenrae and a couple of small lean-tos that some of the priests and clerics uh, rest in. The, the point of this is that the monastery is really difficult to reach and it's a test of mind and body to anybody who tries to visit. But instead of sermons and ceremonies, when a visitor makes it up to the top, the high cleric instructs the visitors to just simply sit or lie on those sun-baked slabs and just contemplate and meditate hmm. on their past, on their life. Other than that, couple, two more places I want to call out. Beacon. Uh, is a small chapel that's in the packed port on Eox. It's a it's well established, and the purpose there is to soothe the minds and souls of those who find the moral relativity of the undead of Eox a little bit too much. Um, beacons <laughs> open around the clock. I was gonna say twenty four by seven, but that's I don't know if. They, there's 24 hours in their day and seven days in their week. So it's open around the clock and visitors are encouraged to come whenever they need to, uh, light a candle, spend several minutes in prayer. And the uh, high cleric there is a female fey child gnome by the name of Luxotroskin. And then the last one I want to call out and I kind of gave Corey just a little tiny spoiler before we started recording on this one. Is in the Vescarium, <laughs> the worship of Damaratash is obviously the most popular religion. However, there is, the Saren Ray is no stranger to the Vescarium and, um, Vesk Prime is actually the system's closest planet to the sun. So Vesk illustrations of Saren Ray actually have her having a circle of crimson scales around her head and these leathery wings similar to like a dragon or a wyvern. And colloquially, she's known as the fire scale instead of the dawn flower. And this version of Saren Ray, as we've talked about earlier, there's different cultural adaptations and cultural depictions of the goddess. And in this version of Saren Ray, uh, the Vesk really put the fire scale as the embodiment of righteous, honorable combat and less focus on redemption and healing. So, um, and that's all really cool, but let's talk about the, the, some of the, um, the church of the flame Walker and what they do. So the worshiper, the Vesk worshipers of fires of the fire scale who belong to the church of the flame Walker, they, they're expected to make a pilgrimage and this pilgrimage consists of marching through a desert barefoot until they reach a cathedral. When they, re when they reach the cathedral, they meet up with the high cleric, who is a Vesk Solarian male by the name of 
Darvoranaz Jurapikash? Jurapikash. Yeah, Darvoranaz Jurapikash. Perfect. That's 100% correct. <laughs> All right. Yeah, who leads them in an extended prayer. And pilgrims who seek an atonement or a blessing from the fire scale. They must undergo a ritual where their feet are then anointed with oil after having walked through a desert. They are then anointed with oil and they have to cross over a bed of flaming coals while reciting an edict of the faith. May I ask a question, Jason? After which the high cleric will then provide healing. <laughs> Is this oil flammable? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, I would assume so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's very Vesk. Yeah, very so Vesk. Vesk. <laughs> so I skipped over a spot earlier because I knew we would come back and talk about areas of worship for Starfinders. Oh. So thank you for leading me in there. Oh, yes. Areas of worship around Galarian for Saren Ray, the primary ones anyway. The aforementioned Kellish Empire, which is basically the the Galarian equivalent of the Middle East, which includes Fan the Fantasy Persia. Fantasy Persia. Which includes the country of Kadira, which is the lone Kellish country in the Inner Sea region. That's her primary center of worship on the entire planet. Uh, but she's also worshipped heavily in Absalom, as most deities are, uh, Katapesh, Osirian, and Thuvia, which the Golden Road area makes a lot of sense because that's right on the... right by the Kellish Empire. And then, surprisingly, one of her biggest centers of worship is still Taldor. So, yeah. which which kind of makes sense if we're thinking like the Golden Road is basically if we're if you if people are familiar and can visualize it, think of the think of a road from Rome through Turkey down to the Middle East to Persia, and that's basically the Golden Road. Think of it that. And so, all along the golden golden road, from Taldor down is, yeah. But now on to the uh, the holidays. Unsurprisingly, the two biggest Saren Saren Ray holidays are celebrated in the middle of summer in her holy month Sarenath. Which is the equivalent Which of... corresponds with June, I believe? Yeah, it's either June or, June or July. <coughs> it's June. Okay. Erastus is July, unfortunately. <laughs> Second reference to... <laughs> that we've made. <laughs> oh. Alright. But... So, both of those are in Serenith. Um... Burning Blades on the 10th of Serenith, which coincides with a a dervish dance Ooh. performance. And then the Sunrot Festival, which is on the summer solstice. The longest day of the year where the sun is the highest. So, those are, those are two of her holidays. And then the third holiday is... Candlemark, which is a more personal holiday. And it's on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. And it's where worshippers spend the day remembering why they joined the faith of Serenray. And it's also traditionally a day when people proclaim their faith for Serenray makes sense shortest day of the year you want the sun back <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely uh, very cool uh, then uh, a couple of aphorisms for you because I always like to talk about the aphorisms because I 
I really love peppering them into the speech of NPCs or PCs. Um, the Dawn Brings New Light. Often used as a litany against evil and despair, this phrase reassures the faithful that each day is a new opportunity, a promise from Saren Ray that things will get better even if only in the afterlife. It's also used to welcome and bless good things in life such as the birth of a child, monetary gains, and delicious meals. <laughs> and then, for the sun in the fury, a battle cry upon the light of Saren Ray and her righteous anger at unrepentant evil. Uh, paladins like to shout it when they smite fiends. Clerics trumpet it when they invoke holy fire. Uh, traditionally, it is painted or carved on the cornerstones of temples. Which, actually, we haven't talked about the uh, paladin code, have we? I was just I was just about to bring it up. <laughs> I was just about to bring it up. Mike, did you do you have the paladin code? Do you want to go through it or yeah? Uh, yeah go no, for I actually, it. I actually had the boons and the and the okay. curses. I can. Um, I'll go. Th I'll go okay. through the pal paladin code real quick. So the paladin code, again, this is first edition. This is first edition from Inner Sea Gods, but it still is relevant to anybody playing a champion in second and second edition. So these are just tenants that if you are a champion or a paladin of Saren Ray, that your order would follow and abide by. And so first one being, I will protect my allies with my life. They are my light and my strength as I am their light and their strength. We rise together. Number two, I will seek out and destroy the spawn of the rough beast. If I cannot defeat them, I will give my life trying. If my life would be wasted in the attempt, I will find allies. If any fall because of my inaction, their deaths lie upon my soul and I will atone for each. Number three, I am fair to others. I expect nothing for myself, but that which I need to survive. Huh, I like that one. Number four, the best battle is a battle I win. If I die, I can no longer fight. I will fight fairly when the fight is fair, and I will strike quickly and without mercy when it is not. Number five, I will redeem the ignorant with my words and my actions. If they will not turn toward the light, I will redeem them by the sword. <laughs> I love that I, one. I think that's the one that the, the cult of the, the cult probably took a, that one a little bit to heart. Yeah, a little bit too much. Number six. I will not abide evil and will combat it with steel when words are not enough. I do not flinch from my faith and I do not fear embarrassment. My soul cannot be brought for all the stars in the sky. It cannot be bought for all the stars in the sky. Number seven. I will show the less fortunate the light of the dawn flower. I will live my life as her mortal blade shining with the light of truth. And last... Each day is another step toward perfection. I will not turn back into the dark. Ooh, I like that one. I think that might yeah. be my favorite. That last one. I like that. All right. Progress, not perfection. All right, All right Mike, Mike. Give us the boons and the uh, curses. Just a little bit of it. I just discovered this today. It's up to the GM. If you are a non divine bent class if you were a worshiper if the GM was well you know kind enough if you did something you would get, be able to get those boons as well it's up to GM discretion as mm -hmm. everything is mm -hmm. same with the curses uh, that's true yep we, we had a a player get cursed by Abadar in our Age of Ashes game because he stole from the temple of Abadar that'll do it <laughs> Uh, the boon for the minor boon your healing hands are blessed with warm flames once when you heal another creature ins uh, instead of healing it for the normal amount you heal it to full hit points no matter how much damage they took holy shit really Saren Ray typically grants this boon in extremely coincidental situations I wish I would have known that about five weeks ago 
<laughs> Moder- I love Seven, though. I have to say it. Uh, Moderate Boon, your blade burns the irredeemable. Your attacks deal an additional 1d6 fire damage that ignores fire resistance. Mm-hmm. Major Boon, I don't know if this is... A, I, would, I would argue that this is pretty... Eh, but it works for the redemption. You are the voice of peace in uh, rehabilitation. When you roll a success at a check to request something, you get a critical su- success instead. In addition... All creatures other than fiends, undead, and mindless creatures allow you one chance to speak your piece and make requests before entering combat. The caveat is, if you or your ally ever use this time to re- for the request to gain an advantage in the combat that's coming, for example, casting pre- uh, preparatory spells, positioning yourselves for a better, you know, a better start, or waiting for your opponent's preparatory spells to end... Sanrei immediately revokes this boon and will possibly curse your allies, which brings you to the curses. The minor curse, the sun burns to you for your transgressions. You receive a sunburn, and you're permanently clumsy one. Permanently? Permanently clumsy one. Until you get rid of the curse, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a real bad sunburn. That's there, Then that's the minor? That's the minor. Well, the, wow. I'm going to get to the minor and the, and the major. It makes sense. Uh, the moderate is the sun shines its light on everything you say. You are unable to tell lies. Liar, attempt- liar. It's liar, liar. You can still withhold information or lie by omission, but that's the liar, liar. Yeah, it's literally, my pen is really blue. That's exactly what it is, because it says that if you attempt to do lie, to, to lie, you instead compulsively burn out the truth, no matter the questions. In the major curse... Saren Ray restricts your ability to harm others. All attacks you make, spells you cast, and any other sources of damage you deal are non-lethal, except against fiends and undead. And you can't ever make them lethal using like a class ability or anything like that. Forever, everything you do. In addition, all creatures except for fiends and undead, which makes sense, gain a plus four status bonus to their armor class and saving throws against your attacks and effects. Plus four. Wow. Plus four is intense in Tui. Yes, a four? Like, a plus one is a big deal. A plus four is... You're never hitting that creature. Which makes sense. It's a major curse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, and on top of that, you're clumsy one? Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. So you're sunburned. You can only tell the truth, and you're really, and you're, you're just, you got pillows on your hands, right? I Yikes. love it. I, I mean, I guess about a month ago, I must have done something to piss Saren Ray off because I got a nasty sunburn in July. <laughs> All right, Mike. This is what you've been. It's, this is yeah, what you've been yeah. ta- wanting to get to. It's you yeah, again, because yeah. we're on to the planar yeah. allies. You've been this, itching, man. I've been itching because this. Saren Ray has one very interesting planar ally that I don't think we've had in any of the other deities we've covered thus far. But first, it's uh, one of her planar allies is Bryla or Bryla. The serving of Saren Ray is manifested as a wheel of flaming sunlight. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Charlabu. Basically a wheel archon, but bigger. Yes. Yes. Huge. Charlabu Charlabu is a gold-colored hound archon that usually appears in its canine uh, canine form. So, you know, picture the um, Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue Zordon. The big blue dog, but it's gold. This is the um, one. Or, um... uh... Lockjaw. Lockjaw from Fantastic Four. Just gold. Yep. All right, all right. So there's one person that just popped when I said that, and that, that's for you. The Lightspeed that, Rescue. That was Corey. Yeah, that was for Corey, the Power Rangers reference. Mist Morning. This is an intelligent animated sword that has the same powers as a celestial unicorn. <laughs> so what you're telling me is 
Paizo had some Battle Zoo stuff before Battle Zoo stuff came out, right? Because I, th- I think you were talking, we were talking about this, or you spoke about this when you had your interview. By the way, listen to that interview, it's great. Uh, I do plugs all the time now. Can't we play in, in like a intelligent yeah, item now? Yeah, intelligent weapons coming out in, in soon. I don't remember what month it is, but you will be able to play an intelligent weapon. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That sounds. That's so cool. But you're an animated intelligent weapon, so you can move yourself around. I guess little arms and legs. I can I don't finally know. play you... Harim. Yes, you can play yeah, anything. I think the intelligent weapons are very, going to be very much like the dungeons, where they mm-hmm. can manifest an avatar. And yeah. that's, that wields them. Yeah. That's really cool. But really, like, the weapon is the character. So when the per- when the weapon goes to sleep, the body just kind of... I think the body just disappears. Maybe. Yeah. And the final is Sun Lord... Sun Lord... Lalakolos? There you go. That's right. Uh, this is her herald. It's a platinum-skinned angelic minion that is escorted by 11 divine doves a very particular number which I don't know why and it's been the bane of my existence ever since we made the we, we, we said we're going to do Saren right when I read that I was like why 11 11 has to do with something and I can't figure it out and it makes me mad it's my 4908 <laughs> but that's for divine allies that I think that brings us to spoiler corner but yeah, spoiler cor- corner. We need to make a drop for this. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to come up with a drop for sp- sp- spoiler corner. There, I just did it. <laughs> and then I'll have to like put some music on it. Uh, yeah. So what do, what, what are we spoiling? So uh, we're gonna do um, uh, Frozen Flame, and I know because Mike wants to talk about Frozen Flame. Uh, and then the other thing that I have is a Strength of Thousands spoiler. Okay. But, uh, otherwise she's yeah as big of a goddess as she is, she hasn't had a lot of direct influence. Not direct influence. She's mentioned in almost every AP. That's like a passing right. mention. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Yeah, I think that's about it. So, yeah, just uh, Frozen Flame and Strength of Thousands. And um, in in uh, Starfinder, there's Dawn of Flame and Dead Suns, which I think she has a bit more involvement in, but I haven't read either of those APs. <laughs> and Mr. Parker's not here. Mm-hmm. So um, if... I know Adam listens to these, and if, Adam, if you have... Um, if you have some some um, Saren Ray spoilers from Dead Suns or Dawn of Flame feel free to drop those in the channel or Finder I know Finder's a big Starfinder person as well or Sadness Finder at this point as yeah, he yep. is currently calling himself I, you know what I'm not going to call on anybody uh, so I called out those two but hey if a- anybody if you have any mm-hmm. other Spoiler corner more moments. Feel free to drop those into the channel with the spoiler brackets, and we'll be more than happy to check those out. So yeah. So the the spoiler corner portion for Strength of Thousands is also the other pantheon that Saren Ray is part of, and that is the Touch of the Sun pantheon, which involves Saren Ray and the risen sun gods of Mazali. Which are Chohar, Luhar, Tihar, and yeah, those are the three. And then I believe I can't remember the name, but the, a fourth was added to the Pantheon in Strength of Thousands. Like, that's part of the the plot of Book 4 is you help this god ascend to 
to reclaim her spot as a god. Uh, she was killed right before she ascended. And she, uh, she helps you defeat the avatar of, of Mazali's evil sun god. Blanking on his name. Uh, Volcana. The, the, okay. the asshole undead child god. <laughs> He's just, oh, I hate him. Partially because I've met him in game, uh, because I play in Strength of Thousands. But, uh, yeah. You, uh, you help to bring back the Sun Gods along with, uh, returning the, uh, um, uh, helping the Bright Lions, which are the the rebel group essentially reestablish their worship so I have a feeling we're going to see the end of Volcana's uh, reign of terror in the near future in Paizo I would be unsurprised if they do a high level adventure or a high level adventure path in Mizali taking him down for good hmm That'd be interesting. Deja Mumbe is the the other the other sun god, the one that you help ascend. And she is the sun god of the eclipse. Because oh. in the in the Mizali sun god pantheon, there are basically there are three sun gods that they have primarily, and that is a sun god of the dawn a sun god of the noon, and a sun god of the dusk. And then the fourth one is the sun god of the eclipse. So she is both moon and sun. Very cool. That is very cool. Jason, okay. I I, I don't want to know very anything about, you know, yeah, I was, flame. So I was, yeah, I was going to... <laughs> I was going to be very vague and on this spoiler corner just because Mike is one of my players in my quest for the Frozen Flame game adventure. So suffice it to say that there there is a legend associated with the titular Frozen Flame and the burning mammoths and the broken tusks as well as lots of other tribes and followings in the realm of the Mammoth Lords worship Sister Cinder, the aspect of Saren Ray. Now, most of the most of the of the Broken Tusks still continue that tradition and depicting dedicating a lot of their rituals and their holidays to Sister Cinder. And they rely on her guidance uh, throughout the the harsh winters as they're trying to get through them to the spring and the summer. Um, but beyond that, there, yeah, I'm beyond that. I, there is there is a little bit more to it um, when it comes to, like I said, the titular. Um, frozen flame, and uh, but yeah, I, I, I this, just, this is one we're gonna re. This is one we'll we'll have to revisit yeah. um, when we do AP re recaps, which will come after we are done with gods. Yep, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I was just gonna say we're planning on doing um, going through all the adventure paths, and we'll revisit this topic some point but yeah sorry mike you, you, you oh, i was go gonna ahead. say yes we are absolutely insane everyone because i'm sure as soon as that came out everyone the people who are listening are like that's crazy yeah exactly we are i was gonna <laughs> say jason just as a, i i don't know i don't know if you've noticed this yet about seven since you've only played with seven after you tpk'd our whole party with like 16 gargoyles 
You sound a little bitter, Mike. I, I've always wanted to play a dragon, and I played a dragon for four, four levels, and I'm heartbroken. Like, I've lost thousands of characters. Not a joke. I played for, you know, countless years. I've lost countless characters. But, like, that the little boy in me has always wanted to be a dragon. Like, I'm a you know, little inner dragon, like, you know what I mean? And and I had Cothrox for just a little bit. It was so good. And, like, I, I treasure that moment. Now I'm playing an absolute lunatic who uses their own spells against themselves. So I know that Seven is the type of... Uh, by the way, Seven is a she Magus, which is fun to play. Uh, I'm going to... The second I can look at the Frozen Flame, I'm probably going to grab it or touch it. So I don't know. I don't think it's good. I, I have a good backup. I have a really cool backup. So I have a feeling if I touch the Frozen Flame, the Primordial Flame, I'm going to burn. And... Hey, listen, I live... Seven lived like he... Like he died like he lives. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's... um. Yeah, but beyond that, she's not... She's super, super popular. But her direct involvement in the lore is pretty... Like, Pretty I haven't small. read Legacy of Fire, but I don't think she's super involved in that one even. Despite no, she's where not. it is. Like, she did she did blast a hole into Rova Gug's cell because of a couple uh I right, think it was but a that wasn't an adventure spoiler. No, no. That was just a cool a cool thing to bring up that that's that's why the pit uh, that's why the spawn of Rova Gug climb out of is is because uh Saren Ray cooked a little something up and threw a smite down. Yeah, even in Legacy of Fire, from what I've read, it's not. It's more. It's more that this is the, this is the religion of the land type situation. Why it was written up more than her actual direct involvement. Mm -hmm. I I do want to say this because of Legacy of Fire, because I've read it, uh, and this is just because of a specific knoll that I have love for. Not all knolls, because knolls are the big bet or you know they're the big bad of that region yeah you know they're the the quote unquote problem and uh you know not all gnolls are bad so yeah you know yeah we have, we have one particular beefy boy I, I was gonna say on my, the show yeah my my bathrobe lothario <laughs> well not anymore but. not anymore yeah yeah, right. yeah. you anyway, never killed him though no I didn't D no I despite didn't despite my best Despite my best efforts, <clears throat> almost. Though almost. Corey, he did kill one of Johnny's characters, though. Right? Yeah, just not Roden. Just not Roden. No. So. Yeah. GL been... GLKJ has been effective. GLKR has not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there. There's not for lack of trying. <laughs> He, he, he's been in quite a few scrapes, and I was actually talking to Weber about that. He's like, how did Rodin survive that combat? He got critted for 34 hit points. I was like, yeah, he's a great knoll. He starts with 10 hit points. Monks get 10 hit points plus their con modifier. Yeah, he has a lot of hit points. Anyway, all right. I think next month we are going to try and do it'll be October so we're going to try to do Ergothoa we'll see if we can get is this the September episode? yeah I'm trying to I is thought it? we were going to push this out in August okay so yeah we'll have to figure something so not Ergothoa, Ergothoa is going to be October <laughs> I think we'll have to figure out... No, Desna. We're going to do Desna. We're going to try to... Tyler, re... yep. We're going to try to redo the Desna episode that we lost. Also, to jump into something to something you added, Jason, we could have done Gorum because metal. True, does he... Yeah, he no, does. No, I don't know. I don't know. I just thought it would... It makes the most he, sense. Does he have the... Does he have a metal domain? Let me take maybe? a look. Maybe? I don't mm -hmm. know, but it makes sense if he does. Lord and Iron? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Confidence, destruction, might, zell. But he, I don't think there is a metal domain, is there? Well, there's a metal Probably element. Probably not. 
Uh, chaos, destruction, glory, strength, and war in 1E. Blood, so. duels, ferocity, protean, rage, resolve, and tactics as there is, subdomains. There, there is a metal domain now that was introduced in Rage of Elements. That's what I'm saying. Oh, for the, the metal elemental lords. So I'm guessing Gorm might there might be a there might be an errata where he gets it. Why the it would fuck be... is Gorum in Elysium? Valhalla. You you die when you you die in battle, you go to your perfection. You know. Uh, fields of battle is uh, surrounding Cadence domain, so probably where he is. Just a big yeah. old war and a party in the middle. Yep, pretty much. It's it's the bloodshot eye of Abendego. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Yeah, we'll try to get Desna, and then we'll have uh, Ergothoa on deck for October. And we'll see who's coming up in November. Anything else? Are we calling it? May your party never end? That's about it. May your party never end.